trick. Morning everyone, welcome back for another video, this time about my ultimate home storage battery. So where do I start with this? Well, as I've mentioned in a couple of other videos, I've been thinking while I've been testing these home storage batteries that what I need is the perfect battery, the best battery for me, the ultimate battery. I don't want to do it in multiple stages necessarily. I want the battery that's right and I don't want to regret it a year later and do something else. I want the ultimate battery for me, the home storage battery. So what does that mean? How did I go about designing, choosing my ultimate home storage battery? And that's what I want to cover today. What it is that I'm buying and why am I buying it? So let's, let's start with the process up front. And that really is writing down on paper, what do I want from what I've learned so far about all these home storage batteries. One of the first things I thought about is the company, the company that makes the battery and the inverter which one am I going to choose? Because I'm aligning with them for a long time. These batteries are not for a year, two years. They're for 10, 20, maybe 30 years of use. And I want support along that uh, journey with the battery. So which one would I choose and why? And it's it's been lovely working with a company like My Energy for the uh, electric car charger that I have at the front of the house, the Zappi. But they were a startup company. They were a new company. They've had teething issues, growing issues, and the software has been, well, it's been a pain in the bum sometimes. You know, you've got to confess, it hasn't been a smooth, easy journey. Great charger, great company, great story, but <laughs> still growing pains. They still, after several years, haven't got the hands around their app and their data as much as I would really like. And it's mostly impatience on my part. I want more and I want it sooner. But of course, they need to get the company sustainable. They need to grow it in the right way, professionally, etc. They need to enhance the product range, all of those great things, and struggle with COVID and struggle with parts availability, all those great things. But I don't want to do that same thing again. I don't want to use a startup company. So a company like Give Energy is one that I'm a little bit concerned about because they are quite new to the market. I hadn't heard of them until a year or 18 months ago, and they seem to be growing rapidly. The software seems pretty good. The hardware seems pretty good. It's Chinese based. The owner of the company has a lot of Chinese experience. I understand he, he lived and worked and ran companies out in China for quite a while and has now brought this Give Energy solution to the UK. Um, but it's where is it going afterwards? How long is it going to last? Will it transform? Will he be selling the business? Will he be going back to China? Will the software be developed onwardly for years to come? There isn't, there isn't a legacy. There isn't um, a history for me to see what's going to go on. You have to buy what you see and hope. And yet I want more than that. I want um, something I can be more certain will be there in the future. So what else is available and what should I go for? Well, there's so many new batteries and new startups. This is part of the problem that you can choose them, but you just don't know how reliable they're going to be into the future. Not just the hardware, but support. If something goes wrong, is somebody available at the end of the phone? Will someone come out and actually look at the battery? Can you get support online for them? How much of a community is there for their solution? So for me, that was a big number one. As I mentioned, software updates is the big one. So is the company progressive enough that they are into their software updates? Are they providing regular software updates? And are they functional? Are they good? Or are they the sort of updates where you wish you hadn't got it because the system doesn't work after you've actually installed the update? So it's that reliable software update and that good foundation for a system of monitoring that I was looking for. As you know, I love my data. I love monitoring. It is a key component of buying an inverter. The inverter, whether it's for your solar or for your battery, that provides the information on the power and that's providing the interface to your monitoring platform as well. So the inverter is absolutely key from your visibility of what's going on. So what do I want from a platform? Well, the most important thing is instantaneous live updates. What I do not want is updates that are like every five minutes. Um, I've struggled with that with some applications in the past, and that just doesn't work for me. I want something that's more granular, that I can see more instantly, and I can tell what's going on. The battery I see as a system that should see everything. It should see your grid, it should see your solar, it should see all of your battery in and battery out. It should be a central place for seeing everything. So unlike my energy, which might, if you say install a hybrid DC battery, not see your battery, 
it's frustrating that you've got a bit of data over here and you've got a bit of data over there and what you want to do is see it all in one place so for me the battery is a place where i can bring it all together so that's what i'm looking for i'm looking for a solution that covers everything one of the frustrations I've seen with other systems is that data is not recoverable. So if the internet goes down or the servers at the other end go down, which if it's a new startup company, etc., it probably will. What I want is something recoverable where the data is local, where I can see the data locally on the system, but then also the data is uploadable afterwards. That's quite an important feature for me. Then there's what you can monitor as well. What I want is something where there's some in-depth advanced features where I can look at, say, the temperature of the batteries, the voltage. I want to be able to look at the internals and see what's really going on. Because when there are issues, I need the data to be able to analyze them. And I want to do that analysis. I don't want to just pick up the phone and be frustrated waiting for someone to look or for someone to access it online so they can have a look. Because what if it's offline? What if that's the problem? How do you get support to connect your battery up if the online connection is the problem. I want to be able to do some self-support of these things. And one of the other frustrations that I've seen is date ranges. It's quite simple, you know, you see a lot of charts that are day, week, month and year. That's it. What if I want to do 48 hours? What if I want to do 72 hours? What if I want to see two weeks worth? It should be more flexible. It's your data, isn't it? I, I feel as though I don't want a constrained system. I want a system where it's my data. It's my system. I want to be able to look at it and manipulate it and analyze it in any way I want. It is my data. Now, whether that means that I can download the data, well, that's great in some respects, but I'm not a computer user. I don't use um, Windows uh, laptops and desktops and I don't want to regularly import data. So it needs to be easy to do in those date ranges. So easy access to the data. And if you can't tell already, yeah, the data is important to me. I don't know whether it will be to everyone out there because some people want to install solar panels and home storage batteries, then completely forget about them and just presume they're doing their job. But of course, that's not always the case. And to optimize them, you do have to keep an eye on them and watch them because it's not just the system you're optimizing, it's your use of it. And if you're not watching, if you're not paying attention, how can you align your usage to your solar and your battery? So I, I think monitoring is actually a key component of buying a home storage battery system. Then there's the practical configuration side of things. You know, I need to be able to charge the battery. There's no point having a 200 kilowatt hour battery here that I can't charge from solar, that I won't fill up and it would take a month or two months to fill up. That's pointless. What I need is something that I can fill up and I can also use. So it mustn't be oversized that um, it's too big for me to use and it mustn't be too big that I can't fill it up as well. And by filling it up, what I'm thinking about is the winter usage. So where I'm not charging the battery on solar energy, but I'm charging it up overnight on cheap, reduced rate energy, like on Octopus Go. So there's no point having a battery that on the three hours or four hours of cheap energy that I get overnight won't charge up because then it'll only be 50% used or 30% used or whatever and I won't get my value from it. So the power that it can accept in needs to be enough to be able to fill the battery in a short period of time. So high, higher charging rates is quite important. Otherwise, I'll be restricted to energy tariffs that are five, six, seven hours in length of cheap energy. And I'm not so convinced that that's the case. I think the way the energy market's going is cheap energy will be in shorter periods, like the Agile product, where you get half an hour or an hour of really cheap energy, and then it's not thereafter. So I want a system that can charge up significantly in those small periods. So higher charging rates is important for me. That's down to the ability of the inverter, but also the size of the battery. If you've got a small battery, then it won't charge and it won't discharge at high rates. You need a bigger battery to be able to get the charge rate in and out as well. So with that, what about the capacity? Um, how much do I need and how do I go about calculating that? Well, I've been very lucky, haven't I, over the last couple of years testing batteries. I know what I use. In the summer, I use a fraction or five kilowatt hours. So that's four and a bit kilowatt hours usable battery. So I'm not using very much, maybe two, two and a half, three kilowatt hours max during uh, the summer months. That's what I have been able to use. In the winter, I use it all. I fill it up and use it and empty it. Not every day, I must confess. I haven't emptied it even in the winter every single day. 
but that's because I've been cautious and I've restricted my usage according to the system that, that I've got. And that's the key factor. What I want is to anticipate my needs once I'm free. How much could I have and how much would I use and how useful and flexible would that be to me? So not only have I looked at the data to see how much I need, I've also then considered my usage and considered what flexibility I want. And what do I mean by that? I mean the sort of thing that um, in the evening when my batteries run out at say four o'clock in winter and it's really cold, I can light a fire in the house with the log fire. But if I don't want to do that, I need to use electric heaters. So how many kilowatt hours might I need to run those heaters in the night? And that extra power that I haven't been using so far because it wasn't there and I've been avoiding grid usage, how much do I need to make it more comfortable to not use that log burner, those sort of things. So I've been trying to size the battery to cater not just for what I have used, but what I intend to use and to make it the most flexible system possible for me in the future so that I have a choice. Can I heat my hot, hot water at any time I want? Can I turn heaters on at any time I want? Will I not run out of battery? Well, there's, there's an important point. Am I configuring the system so that 365 days a year I don't run out of battery? That might be a little excessive. That's like buying a five or 600 mile range EV because I'm never gonna run out on any journey. But I'm only gonna do that one journey of 500 miles once every three years. It's a bit excessive. So having an oversized battery to cater for 100% of the situations I want is a bit daft, but I've got one where I'm probably, well, I've had one where I've used probably 70, 80% of all situations are covered just by a five kilowatt hour battery. So I'm only trying to resolve um, those extra 20% of situations where I run out of battery or increase that range by using it more flexibly and using the battery more into the future. I, I hope that makes sense. So it's about not oversizing it, but not undersizing it as well. Undersizing it is the most cost economical way of doing things because you'll get the highest use out of it. You can thrash it, etc. So you will get better value from a smaller battery. So if we installed um, a three kilowatt hour battery, that would be very cost economical from just the battery part of the installation. If you double it, then the extra value you're getting, the extra kilowatt hours you're going to save from the extra three kilowatt hours won't be as good as the the first three, and then when you add another three to make it nine, those six to nine kilowatt hours won't be as usable and you won't get as much value from it as the original ones. That's my opinion and my experience. It does depend on your usage, of course, and how big your usage profile is. I want a flexible and modular system. So I want something that if I have made a mistake or in five years time, I decide I really want to expand the system, then I want something that is modular and will be upgradable in the future. What I don't like the idea of are systems like, and I'll quote Give Energy again, it's where the inverter and the battery are only compatible with each other. And what I also see is it's the range of batteries that are out now that are compatible with the inverters they've got out now. The old batteries that they had previously won't work alongside the new batteries. That sort of system doesn't suit me because when I want to upgrade in the future, you're talking about perhaps taking the whole system out and putting a whole new system in. I don't want that. I want something I can build and add for the future, both inverter power wise, like having a power wall and adding a second power wall, I also want it to be expandable from the battery perspective. That's one of the reasons why I want to go for a separate inverter by a different manufacturer to the batteries. I want the inverter to be compatible with a range of batteries and I want the batteries to be upgradable easily. Fast response times. You've probably heard me talk on videos before about the ramp up and ramp down and how annoying it is to have a battery that's supposed to cover your electrical loads in your house. But when you turn something on, it takes 10, 15 seconds or more for the battery to fully provide the power for it. So it's still drawing from the grid. And then when you turn that device off, it's still providing the power. So you're actually exporting from the battery out to the grid while it's ramping down. So that ramp up and ramp down, I want to minimize. And I've been on a quest to find out what the hell is that about? Why do they do it? And why does the Tesla Powerwall not do that? Because that seems to have instantaneous responses. You might see some of my videos in the past. I've done tests alongside John Tisbury's system who has a power wall and his system is instantaneous. My systems have not been instantaneous when I had the pure drive and give energy battery. 
What I found is the ramp up and ramp down is due to the UK legislation and every different country has different legislation about how you have to ramp up and ramp down energy into the grid. So the battery systems have to be compatible because they're grid connected. If they're not grid connected, if they're off grid, then there's no rules. You can do what you like. It's your system. It's your home. So it's the grid and the country that's restricting with its rules of ramping up and ramping down. Now, to make more sense of that, think about a field with a thousand solar panels in. It's providing megawatts of power. Well, a cloud comes over and the megawatts goes down to a few kilowatts and then the cloud passes and you get the sun again and you get some megawatts. So how much power can go into the grid and then stop going into the grid? And how does it ramp up and ramp down? Those are the rules. They're designed for bigger systems, but those ramp up and ramp down rules apply to household batteries as well. The way that I think Tesla Powerwall gets away with it is that it isolates itself from the grid. It uses a gateway and that gateway box is like um, a firewall to the grid. So it's actually working off grid but then switches to the grid and brings energy to the grid as and when it needs to. But if it can work isolating itself from the grid and running in parallel to the grid, creating a parallel grid system in your home, then you can work without those rules and the power will be instantaneous. What I want, if I can, is a battery inverter system that provides instantaneous power. What confuses me about this is why was the pure drive and the give energy battery that I tested so much worse than the Huawei system that I had as the third battery that I tested? Why was Huawei better? Are they using better ramp up and ramp down rules? Are they fully complying? Are they not? You know, who, who knows what, what the reasons are? What I want is a system that responds really fast. So that's a key component to me because I don't want those wasted tenths of kilowatt hours in and out. Saw an interesting comment on one of my videos the other day where someone was saying if they were given an AC connected battery, they would give it away. They wouldn't want it. They only want a DC connected home storage battery. Well, I'm going for an AC connected battery and you're not having mine. I'm not giving it away. Uh, why am I going for an AC connected battery rather than DC connected? And that's to do with like hybrid inverters. I don't want a hybrid inverter where the power coming from the solar panels is mixed with the power from the battery because one it's difficult for monitoring to tell where the power came from because all you see is it came from that inverter you can't tell whether it came from the battery or you can't tell whether it came from solar you can from the inverter's own system but you can't from your other systems that you might be monitoring data with so it might be more efficient to have dc power from your panels go into a dc battery and that might be uh, fewer losses so it's more efficient but it's not as flexible. And I also don't like the idea that when I've got five kilowatts of solar panels providing five kilowatts of power that I'm charging my car from, if I wanted to boost it and say charge the car at seven kilowatts and use some from the battery, I can't if I have a five kilowatt hybrid inverter for the battery because it's at its limit. So it doesn't matter that the battery's there and can provide extra power up to five kilowatts. If there's already five kilowatts of solar, that's your limit. So it's the combined limit of solar and batteries. What I like about AC connected is that it's not the combined um, power that you're being restricted by. The independence of so the battery power is independent from your solar panels. <clears throat> so you can in effect get more power. Now, the problem with that of course is more power and you're grid connected means you need more authorization from your DNO. So there is a limiting factor to that. And that's why some people are choosing to have DC connected batteries to get around some of those limitations and some people are not. And the last thing that I want for my system, and it is a long list, isn't it? I want something that is useful from an upgrading point of view. I mean, you've seen what I've been doing here. I'm on my third solar install. What if I want a solar tracker? What if I want to put a wind turbine in? What if I want to put something else in? Well, I don't have a system that's easily expandable that I can plug those things into. So what if, what if I could get a battery inverter that is compatible, that I could plug some extra solar into, that I could plug a wind turbine into. So what if I created something that was useful for the future, useful for building on if I want to. So I am looking for an ideal system that provides me with everything that I want. Now, I don't know whether you've seen in the background, what have we got? Um, let's release the first piece, Pylon Tech batteries. So I have 
one, two, three, four, five US 3000C batteries. So why have I chosen Pylon Tech and why have I chosen those US 3000C batteries? Well, the first thing to say is I didn't actually choose those. I wanted the Pylon Tech Force L1 batteries. Now the Force series of batteries are basically exactly the same as this, but packaged better. So no loose wires, no DIY looking to it. They're nice um, flush cases. They're all contained. They're like Lego bricks that you plug the batteries together. And uh, they seem really, really good. Same battery chemistry, same technology, same BMS, extremely compatible, exactly the same, just packaged better. But unfortunately, when we went to order them, they just aren't available yet. Couldn't get hold of them. So I've gone with these US 3000 batteries. Now, here, this installation is temporary. They're actually sat on a pallet, <laughs> so they're um, not in their final position. As I've said online, this system's not fully commissioned. It's not fully working yet. So um, I'm hoping to have a rack right where I'm sitting and they will go into a rack. So I've chosen those because they provide high power output. They're extremely compatible. The thing that amazes me with Pylon Tech, and I talked to my installer who said, aren't they the cheap end of the batteries? And yet when you look at the testing that's been done, they're actually quite resilient and they last better. There's less degradation than a lot of other batteries. But the big, big factor for me was the compatibility. The US 2000 batteries, so the 2.4 kilowatt modules, are compatible with their A, B and C released versions of that battery. But the 2000 batteries are also compatible with the 3000 batteries. You can mix and match them. And also the Force L1 and L2. They're all the same BMS. The BMSs are compatible. They are very, very good systems for upgrading, and I've seen that. I've seen that people are adding US 3000 batteries to their 2000 battery configuration several years later. So for me, all of that upgradability and the power and the fact that it's in my control just makes this a perfect battery. And depending on how much charge rate I want or discharge rate I, I want, then I can just add more batteries. So how did I decide on Five. Well, this is the real funny thing. I only need five kilowatt hours for a very high percentage of all of my needs. Now that five kilowatt hour battery um, provided me with a 2.4 typically kilowatt power rating. So let's get these two things right. Kilowatts, power out of the battery, instantaneous usage, power. So 2.4 extra on top of whatever solar I had was the power I had available. To get more than that, I need more than five kilowatt hours of battery. I need more than five kilowatt hours capacity of batteries. Each of these are 3.5 kilowatt hours of capacity in size. So I thought, right, two of those gives me seven kilowatt hours. That's more than the five. Two should be fine, shouldn't it? No, no, two won't give me the charge rates that I want and the charging, um, discharging power that I want, so three. Three would give me nine, ten and a half kilowatt hours. Now these are great as well because they have a depth of discharge of 90%. So some batteries you're buying that are labeled as like 10 kilowatt hours, you're only gonna get eight out of it because it's a 20% depth of discharge limit. 20% is reserved that you're not allowed to touch. In these, you can go down to 10%. So I'm using more of that three and a half kilowatt hours per battery that's there as well. So three, three's enough then, isn't it? Three's perfect, it's double, it's double what my usage was. So yep, absolutely, three was what I should have gone for and three would have been the right configuration. But when I looked at my inverter, they actually recommended, and here it is, I'll talk about that in a moment. They recommended that four was the right amount to start with for that inverter. That inverter power needs four of those batteries. So oh, go on then, so I only need three, but let, let's have four. Let's do it right. Let's get the right system with lots of power, lots of discharge and <laughs> charging power. So I went with four and uh, four was more than double what my original needs were, my original systems were. So yeah, we're really in the realms here of um, just doubling things because you can. These batteries are about a thousand pounds per three and a half kilowatt hours. So it's not that expensive to say, I'll spend one more thousand pounds and get another battery on top. And that's where the beauty of these modular batteries are. You're not talking about spending another eight or nine thousand pounds for a whole new power wall. You're talking about one thousand pounds more to expand the batteries. 
So one week before the order <laughs> was due to be placed, I made the phone call and said, can you change the four to a five, please? I think I'll just add another one. Um, and there was no logical reason for that other than I don't want to change my mind later. I want more than enough. So yeah, I am really going for this and going for enough configured capacity that hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's as flexible and as powerful as I could ever want. That's what I'm hoping for. No doubt, no doubt there'll be six or seven or eight at some point in the future, but that's why I've chosen this system. That's why I've gone for it, because it's going to be modular. Everyone I've seen that installs solar and installs home storage batteries is always thinking the moment they've done it, how could I get more? What could I do to add another battery? Can I upgrade that? If I've just bought an eight kilowatt hour give energy battery, shall I go for 16? How does that work? So <laughs> I've chosen this system to cater for that and hope I've got it right. So five. Five, three and a half is 15, 17 and a half kilowatt hours. That is the configured size. I'm going to get 90% depth of discharge out of that. That is more than enough for what I want. Partnered with a Victron 48, 5000 uh, multi plus two inverter. Yeah, lots of acronyms with that. The 48, 48 volts. So the 48 inverter, 48 volt batteries. These aren't high voltage batteries, they're low voltage. And the 5000 is 5000 VA, that's what it can invert, 5000 volts times amps. So I'm limited by that power. 5000 VA isn't 5 kilowatts, that's about 3.6 kilowatts continuous power output. And because I did so well and used so little grid energy anyway with the lesser powered batteries, I think 50% more is more than enough. I don't go above two, two and a half kilowatts of extra power needed. So again, let's, let's have talk about a practical example. I'm using two or three kilowatts of power from solar power. I've got something on that's using two or three kilowatts of power. I only turn things on when I've got solar power. You know, you might manually looking at it going, right, three kilowatts of power, I can turn the oven on, turn the washing machine on, that's what I do now. But when you want to turn something else on, you wait until you've got more solar power. That's if you're really, really keen to not use the grid and you're able to watch it and, you know, and you're a really lame, boring person like me. But a battery provides that flexibility so you can let go and not worry about how much solar power there is. If I want to turn the microwave on at the same time as the oven, then the battery picks up that load. But if it's only 2.4 kilowatts of extra power it can provide, I can only provide one extra device being turned on. But I haven't gone over that very much. Partly because I do watch what goes on, but partly because my needs don't go above that. So 50% more power, 3.6 kilowatts of power on top of my solar is plenty for my needs. I don't need the same power as a Tesla Powerwall. I don't need five kilowatts of power on top of my solar power that I've got. So I think this is the perfect compromise for me. It's a compromise because you always want more power. You know, I'd have 10 kilowatts of battery and 20 kilowatts of solar if I could. But it's excessive and as I said at the start going over what your 80, 90, 95, 99 percent of your needs is is just spending a lot of money for very very diminishing returns. So I think I've optimized it 3.6 kilowatts of power out 3.6 kilowatts of charging rate is enough to charge the battery up of 17 kilowatt hours in the right amount of time for me and leave a little bit of headroom for filling up on solar later as well. So I think I've configured it just about right for me. The Victron Inverter has a really good online system. It's been around for years. They do put updates out and some of the updates um, just uh, stagger me as to what you see and what makes this sort of solution different. The latest release of software that's out for Victron right now makes some wireless thermometers compatible with the Victron inverter. So you can plug a wireless thermometer in over Bluetooth, because this is Bluetooth compatible, and monitor the temperature of various things. So I could have a temperature uh, monitor on my batteries. And then there's logic inside the Victron inverter that's monitoring that temperature that can take action. And it's got some extra relays on the inverter. So I can power devices and turn fans or heaters on depending on what the temperature is on those temperature probes. And that's some of the power capability of Victron inverters. They're very capable, very complex systems, and they're mostly installed, I would say, in off-grid solutions and in marine solutions on boats. And that's where you would want all of these extra features. So that 
by buying into a Victron inverter, you're getting that wealth of technology, you're getting that wealth of previous use and people systems that are much more complex and much more demanding than just home storage battery. So there's a lot, there's a lot to these devices and there's a lot of extra features and functions that work. Some of that is that I can DC connect some extra solar panels. So on my, where is it? Let's see if we can show it. On this device here, this is the GX device that provides all the communications uh, to the internet and between this device and other things. I could have a solar charger on here, a Victron solar charger that connects to this and obviously to this and the solar power can be DC inverted into the battery alongside my AC coupling. So I can have a mixed hybrid solution of AC coupled and DC coupled devices. That sort of flexibility I haven't seen with any other system out there. Um, this really is, I wouldn't say it's the Rolls Royce of solutions, but it, it just ticks every box. And that's why I've gone for it. One of the things that impressed me with Victron was when we had the Pure Drive battery here a couple of years ago, it actually had a Victron inverter on the inside of it. Um, Pure Drive were basically just taking components, bolting them together and selling them as a solution uh, labelled under their own brand. Um, but, but I had some issues with connectivity with that. And it's where you'd normally have to call the installer out and the installer would have to come and sort things out. And obviously they're busy and extremely busy at the moment, aren't they? So getting someone back for something as simple as resetting, rebooting, reconnecting your um, inverter to the internet, it's, it's just not going to happen or not for a long time. So I found that by looking online and looking at forums of all these users with off-grid solutions and boat systems, etc., there were plenty of examples of people experiencing exactly the same as I did. So I found it very easy to find out how to reset it myself and find the manual way of getting to the GX device and reconfiguring it. So as a complete novice, knowing nothing about the systems, I found I could support myself on that system to a reasonable degree. And I've also done it on this system already. So I, I've bought that for that wealth of knowledge, for that ability to be more self-reliant and not to have to have the installer back all of the time to do simple things. I want it to be my system and I want to be in control of it, in control of the data and in control of well, not necessarily the hardware because I don't go touching the electronics here, but um, I want there to be enough user, end user functionality that I can get out of trouble, I can fix the system, I can reboot the system, I can reconnect it, I can change the networking configuration of it. All of those things. One of the things that I didn't mention, um, get into one of the negatives now, um, one of the things that I want from a system is I want to export to the grid. Now a lot of the problems you find with solar and battery installers and systems is that they're so used to just selling these systems for the benefit of income for people to install them and get fit payments. So you're only installing solar to earn money and therefore all they care about is how many kilowatt hours a year they're going to get. Well, I see that as changing and I want a, a system that's gonna enable me not only to reduce my usage of the grid, but for me to export to the grid, me to help the grid. I think energy trading, powering my battery with solar power, then exporting um, into the grid at peak times or even charging the battery overnight on cheap energy and then exporting at peak times, that's gonna be a profitable thing to do and it's gonna be something I want to do. Victron, I actually talked to the head of sales um, in the UK and he said, no, 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 we don't want that. We don't need that with our batteries because there's no point in doing it. That income you're earning from trading energy, as you say, isn't worth the cost of the cycle on the battery, the degradation that it might cause to the battery by using it more. And I was really disappointed by that because it was a very backward view and a view where clearly they weren't aware of what's happening in the energy market. I would hope now that they can see where the prices of energy is right now, that that potential of trading energy is definitely something we want to do. We want to contribute to the grid. It's not just about making money. I want to contribute to help smooth the grid and make the grid better by providing energy at peak times. Why wouldn't I do that, especially if I'm offered a good price for it? So I want that ability. The Victron inverter doesn't have timed discharging, so I can't export to the grid on a timer, but this inverter uses open source technology. So all of the code that they have there is on open source. There are programs, there are abilities for me to program my own system to do timed exports. So I can connect this to a Raspberry Pi and I can control it from a Raspberry Pi. There are pre-built 
installations like Home Assistant that can do that. And can you believe um, I've done it already? I have connected this Victron inverter to Home Assistant and I can change the parameters. I've been doing Modbus updates directly from my Home Assistant system in the house over our home network to this inverter directly, not to the servers, but to the unit directly and changing its configuration. And uh, I can't believe that I've been able to do that myself. Yes, I am an IT person in the background, but not really with PCs. My background is more um, the physical stuff, big stuff, mainframes, networking, tech support, capacity planning, performance monitoring. That's my sort of stuff on, on major installations for banks, you know, they're big mainframe computers doing servers and PCs and the little stuff. Um, that's not what I've done before. And that's what's required to program some of this Raspberry Pi stuff with this. Um, so I thought I was going to struggle, but actually Home Assistant wasn't that bad and the Modbus stuff wasn't that bad. Again, there was a lot of examples online that showed you what to do. I could see somebody had already done it, so it's easier for me to do. So it's proving already that I've made a good choice because it is working and doing everything I want. I am getting the ability from it that I'm expecting, including timed exports. I am going to be able to change the configuration very, very easily to export when I want to. But that's for the future. Right now, I don't have um, an export ability. I'm not on Agile um, outgoing. That's where I plan to be at some point in the future. So why isn't this fully working? I suppose that's one of the things to talk about. Um, it's covered, it's parts availability, but mostly it's not that the inverter's not working or the battery's not working. It's just a silly, bloody Modbus meter. Um, at the moment, my um, inverter can't see all of the grid use correctly and therefore can't make the right decisions for whether to charge or whether to discharge. So it's not working in its correct state. So I've already seen the batteries working. I've seen it inverting. I've seen the solar power being used and it all blending and working together. So I know it does. And I've seen the off grid part. So yes, I have a, a breaker here where I can turn the grid off. So I can now disconnect the battery from the grid and run the house just from the battery. And that works instantaneously, like the videos you've seen from Fully Charged and the Powerwall. You see just a tiny flicker on the light and everything just carries on as normal. So I do have that power. So why have, why have I done that? Um, why have I gone for not an off-grid capability, but an ability to cater for power cuts, a, a UPS for the house? I chose this inverter because it's rated with a transfer switch of 50 amps. So when there's a power cut, I can have 50 amps of power going through it. And therefore, you know, that's about 12, 12 and a half kilowatts of power, I think. So I'm aware that even when I've got all my heaters on overnight and I'm heating my hot water with the eddy, I don't really get to like 12 and a half kilowatt hours. I'd have to be charging the car at full seven kilowatts, the hot water and all of the heaters and the oven on all at the same time for me to get to that. We don't have um, electric power showers that, you know, run at six or nine kilowatts on top. We don't have electric boilers or anything like that. So 50 amps is plenty. So I have configured that most of the house goes through the inverter, through the battery. So most of my house is off grid. Now, by making it off grid, I'm creating that parallel grid system where the Victron inverter can work without ramping up and ramping down. That's the idea. I haven't tested it yet. God, I hope this actually works and I've got it right. But I believe by putting my house through the power protected circuits of the Victron inverter, I will get that instantaneous response that I want from the battery and that inverter. So that's why I've done it. But I haven't put the whole house, I haven't put everything through it because we've got a 100 amp um, house main fuse. So if I've limited myself, what haven't I put through it? And it's the Zappi. I've decided to not put my Zappi car charger through the uh, UPS part of the battery because in a power cut, charging my car, I don't see as a necessity. If I really wanted to, I could plug it into the 16 amp socket I've got on the wall outside and I could just AC charge it using the slower charging. So I could do that. I can still charge my car, but the Zappi won't work. So it's just preventing the ability of going over that 50 amps and overloading those circuits and uh, that inverter, so protecting it. The installer was nervous saying, you know, 50 amps, you can't run your whole house on that. I know I can, I know I can manage that and not go over it, but I needed some extra protection. So I left the Zappi off. So the whole house is going through it, all the lights, all the sockets, the eddy, the cooker, everything is going through it, much more than 50 amps and all the breakers added up 
but what I will use at the same time will not go over the 50 amps in the event of a power. So there you go, that's my system. Five of these Pylon Tech batteries and a Victron inverter, which is highly capable, highly flexible. And if I really wanted to, I could parallel these. I could have another Victron 5000 and that will provide power of 7.2 kilowatts and much higher charging rates too. So I could double it. I could double the power by having another one of these. I could have another rack of pylon techs and uh, that will work. And I can have a wind turbine. I can have extra solar panels. I could have a tracking solar panel array in my garden. <laughs> I could have um, several ground mounted solar panels in my garden and connect them DC through here and that uh, makes it a very easy install. There's so much um, flexibility that I, I could have with this system. That's why I've chosen it. So I think for me this is the ultimate system. It's more battery capacity that I need. It's way more battery power coming out of the inverter to top up with my solar than I've had before and will be very high 90% covering every need I have. And it should be very fast response times. It does provide virtually whole house backup. The monitoring is excellent. I'm in control of it. And it hasn't cost a fortune. How much does this cost? Yeah, okay, let's go through this. These Victron inverters, I've seen them as cheap as 1200 and 90, 1350 pounds, um, but often they're around 1600 to 1800 pounds. These are not cheap inverters, that's for certain. Then on top, you need one of these. This was 200 and something pounds. Again, I've seen them up to 300 pounds, the GX devices, but I've seen them as low as just under 200 pounds. So you need a communication module, the GX, and you need the inverter as well. Now the Parlantech batteries, as I said, they're about a thousand pounds, just over a thousand pounds per battery. So it depends on how many of those you need, but you do have to size it that you can't have two or three of these batteries with this inverter. You'd have to go for the smaller inverter to go with a smaller um, amount of batteries. Victron though, lots of information online. You know, don't ask me those questions. Go online, have a look at how to configure a Victron inverter if you're interested in doing that and see uh, how the configurations work. I was choosing between Pylon Tech and BYD. Um, these inverters work really well with BYD batteries as well, and I was trying to choose between the two. It really was just that bigger Victron community, and the fact I was seeing so many Pylon Tech batteries going in with that extra compatibility, that's why I chose these two. So there you go, that's my system. Hopefully I've explained everything. Uh, hope you've enjoyed this video and it's given you some insight into how I went about choosing my ultimate system. And I really do recommend it. Work out what you want. Have a think about it. How much power do you want? When are you going to charge it? What time period are you going to have? How are you going to use your battery? Really importantly, how much are you going to watch what goes on? Do you need to look at it? Do you care? Can you be AC connected? Can you export directly from the battery to the grid as well as your solar panels? Do you have that power ability or do you need DC connected? What do you want from your system? There's so many things to think about, but choose a good installer, talk to them about your requirements and they should, if they're flexible and have a range of solutions that they're happy to install, they should be able to help you. Now I've got to say um, a big, big thank you to Power Different over in Hethel, Norfolk. Christian, thank you so much for doing this for me. They don't normally install Victron solutions. Um, it's not something they normally do because they are more complex. So they've done it because it's what I want. And so thank you. Thank you for going that extra mile and uh, helping me get the ultimate system that I want. Thanks to Jordan as well for the actual install so far. Really do appreciate all your effort. It is the ultimate system for me and I appreciate your extra effort to get this system here for me. Thank you so much everyone for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please click that subscribe. Please click like on the video. If you're watching it right now, you must have liked this video. So please click like. It really does help with the YouTube algorithms. Take care. See you again soon everyone. More videos about using this, hopefully when it's fully configured and working in its uh, rack, etc. I can show you that and show you the ramp up and ramp down and I'll either be crying that it doesn't work as I'm hoping or I'll be jumping for joy that it really does everything that I want. So uh, take care, come back for more videos, solar panels, home storage, batteries, portable batteries. I've got one of those to show you too. And uh, of course, electric cars, including my mini electric. Take care, bye for now.